periodic table and trends on the periodic table. We had started this material when we first started doing electron configurations. Feel free to hit pause at any time. This is going to be in two parts. So if you recall, we had had pat we've noticed patterns in terms of electron configuration, and the periodic table is full of patterns. And we noticed also, I said early on in the semester, that is kind of a strange way to arrange it, but we saw patterns in terms of electron configuration. So for example, if you look at just electron configurations, you'll notice, for example, everything in the same column has a similar configuration. So we've said before we developed it this way. Down the first column, everything ends in S1, down column 1. Down column 2, everything has an S2 configuration. Down column uh, 16, as it says on the slide, everything in that column, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, all end in an S2, P4, and so on and so forth. So everything in the same column has similar configurations. As you go across a row, you can see that there's a regular change. So for example, as we did when we were looking through configurations, uh, lithium, beryllium, boron are 2s1, 2s2, 2s2, 2p1, continuing on, continuing on with carbon, s2, p2, and so on and so forth. Uh, you might notice in this particular periodic table that there's some configurations that don't fit the pattern. In Chem 152, everything is going to fit the pattern. What's really interesting is that the periodic table was developed way, way before we learned anything about electron configurations. And a scientist named Dmitry Mendeleev was credited with putting it together in its uh, current form. Uh, he based his work on a lot of other things. He basically arranged it in terms of increasing atomic mass. And originally, he noticed that if you put them in order of increasing atomic mass, each element of similar colors here, for example, helium, neon, argon, which are all green, or lithium, sodium, potassium, which are all pink, note had similar properties. So what Mendeleev did is let's put like things together, put things in similar columns. And Mendeleev came up with the periodic law. Of course, this was in the 1800s. His periodic law was properties of the atoms are a periodic function of atomic mass. Later on, it was revised to be based on atomic numbers. So the modern periodic law says that the properties of the elements are a periodic function of atomic number. Now, what we mean by a periodic function is a function that repeats. So for example, the motion of a pendulum going back and forth, its position in terms of time is going to repeat itself, or the phases of the moon. If you look at what the moon looks like as a function of day, right? The moon phases repeat, it gets bigger, 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 smaller, smaller, smaller. And you can see that the electron configurations repeat as well. So as I said, just to summarize, the periodic table was designed by Dmitry Mendeleev around 1869, put elements together based on their properties. All right, and this column says, this, this slide, excuse me, says a great deal. A couple of definitions, a column on the periodic table is called a group or a family within a group, the properties are similar for the vertical columns on the periodic table. Now, interestingly, what the reason that they're similar, we know that Mendeleev did not know, is that uh, everything has a similar configuration. When you look at how things react, we'll tie that together later on, but we looked at that a little bit as well. You can kind of tie it to what charge ions may form. Periodic tables frequently have a couple of different numbering systems in the old days. Um, the, number, the vertical columns had A and B subgroups. We're moving to a new system where everything is, the columns are just numbered 1 through 18. Uh, a row on the periodic table is called a period, and as you go across a period, there's a regular change in the properties. Uh, now, Mendeleev was so smart, this is where you say, how smart was he? You said it out loud while you were watching this too, didn't you? Anyway, he was so smart that he left blanks in the periodic table for elements that had not been discovered. So smart enough to know that there were things he did not know. And in addition, he successfully predicted the properties of those elements that had not been discovered. So for example, germanium at that time had not been discovered. Mendeleev successfully predicted what the properties of germanium might be. Later on, it was discovered, and he was right. 
anytime you have a theory that allows you to make predictions and those predictions turn out to be true, that means it's a good theory. Pretty cool. So the elements are broken up into two major classes. There are metals and there are nonmetals, and they're also what are called metalloids. So let's start with metals. Metals are on the left side of the periodic table. If you look at the periodic table that's on our Canvas site, um, there's a darkened stair-step line. Things that are below the stair-step to the left and to the left of the stair-step are metals. And you'll notice on the periodic table, most of the elements are metals. They're excellent conductors of heat. They can be pounded, pounded into flat sheets. So malleability, malleable has the same prefix as mallet, like a hammer. They can be drawn into wires. That's called duct being ductile. All metals are shiny. And when you look at a lot of metals, they don't look shiny. The reason they don't look shiny is a lot of metals react with oxygen in the air to form metal oxides. Frequently, they do it very quickly, very readily. Metal oxides are typically black, white, or gray, so they, you know, they, they're not really that shiny color. But if you took a piece of sandpaper to it and sanded it off, you would find that the shiny metal is underneath. Most importantly, in terms of reactivity, metals tend to lose electrons. And if you look at their electron configurations and the valences, you can see why. They also tend to form positive ions, which, of course, if they lose electrons, they form positive ions. Next slide. Okay. Nonmetals are the opposite. They're on the right-hand side and above the stair-step line. right? And like I was just saying, the stair-step line is the dividing line. Uh, Nonmetals typically are gases or brittle solids at room temperature, and they have the opposite properties. They don't conduct electricity. They don't, they're, um, they don't conduct heat very well. They're typically like a rock. If you hit it with a hammer, it crumbles rather than flattening out into sheets. Most importantly, in terms of reactivities, metals tend to gain electrons, and therefore they form negative ions. So think about this. Do you think metals react with nonmetals? Just for a moment. Right? Metals are trying to lose electrons, nonmetals are trying to gain them. So like you make a lodge sale, one thing is looking for the very thing, the other thing is trying to get rid of. Metalloids have intermediate properties. They're along the zigzag line. Uh, in Britain, they call them semi-metals, and they have intermediate properties. Uh, one of the most interesting properties is that they're semiconductors, which means they will conduct electricity, kind of. Really, uh, they'll conduct electricity if you heat them up. Right. Uh, specifically, the metalloids are boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and tellurium. If you look at the periodic table, you'll also notice that aluminum and polonium are on the line, but aluminum is a metal, as is polonium. Okay. Now, what about hydrogen? If you look at the periodic table and you see where the stair-step line starts, hydrogen is in the first row. It is, therefore, above the stair-step, not below it, and it's not really to the left. The stair step starts one row below. Um, Hydrogen is very unusual. It has a configuration of 1s1. Remember, every element is unique. But what's interesting is it can fill its valence by gaining an electron. If you recall, full valence for the first energy level for an s sublevel would be 1s2. So it gains one electron. If it's gaining electrons, it acts like a non-metal. It can also empty its valence by losing an electron. And then it would be 1s0, which would be an empty valence. And remember, empty valence or a full valence is what the octet rule is about. They're very, very stable. In that case, it's acting like a metal. And for example, when does hydrogen act like a metal? In acids, hydrogen acts like a metal. And we may or may not get to acid-base chemistry because of the shortened semester. Um, it's the only atom that can empty or fill its valence with a one electron change. Makes it very interesting. Some of the groups have names. We're not going to deal. I don't care if you memorize the names from my class, meaning I won't test you on the names, but I'm going to use the names so it's very handy if you're familiar with them. So uh, the first column, group one, is referred to as the alkali metals. Group two is referred to as the alkaline earth metals. That would be beryllium, magnesium, calcium. Uh, group 17, so I'm using the newer nomenclature, that's called the halogens, and that's fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Group 18 are the noble gases, which are extremely unreactive. That's helium, neon, argon, krypton, and so on. Now, when we look at the properties and how they're going to vary across the periodic table, across a row, down a column, we want to look at, well, first of all, what do they do when they react? And we've talked about this a little bit right before 
why we had to take a little time out. Metals tend to lose electrons. Therefore, the easier to lose an electron, the more reactive a metal would be. Nonmetals tend, tend to gain electrons. Therefore, the easier to gain electron, also more reactive. The diagram kind of shows what's going on. So sodium, for example, loses an electron, becomes sodium ion. We don't have the configurations on here, but if you look at the configurations, you'll find that in every case they're going to a noble gas configuration. Um, what determines if things will gain or lose electrons or how easily is Coulomb's law. But I'm going to stop here, call this the end of part one of this set of slides, and we'll start on the slide and call it part two.